to the pentonomics program, the alternative to the silly, inane, fatuous financial media. Today's guest is Jim Rickards. Now, I can spend the entire program, which hopefully will be around 20 minutes, just going over this gentleman's resume. So I won't do that. I'll just go over the highlights. Jim Rickards is an economist, a banker, a lawyer. He's the Capital Markets Advisor for the Secretary of Defense and Intelligence Community. He's the editor of the Strategic Intelligence, a financial newsletter published by Agora, of which I am a daily reader, and I suggest my audience do the same. Uh, he's the director of the James Rickards Project, an inquiry into the complex dynamics of geopolitics. And by the way, in his spare time, he's a prolific writer of books. He wrote The Cur uh, Currency Wars, The Death of Money, The New Case for Gold, and his most recent uh, publication, The Road to Ruin. Welcome, Jim Rickards. Michael, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Great to be with you. You created the predictive analytics company called Meridian. What does it have to, t have to say about the coming stock market chaos? I believe the stock market is in for a huge fall, probably north of 50%. I believe we're in a huge bond bubble. And I think I'm pretty much alone in this because if I watch the fatuous financial media, everybody's a huge bubble. Right. You don't feel the same way. You created this program. What does it have to say about what's coming down the pipeline? Oh, thank you, Michael. This uh, this new company, Miraglam, I started with uh, a partner, Kevin Massingill. Uh, Kevin's a fascinating guy. He's a um, he's a lieutenant colonel, uh, army ranger, um, military intelligence, uh, but also a scholar, uh, graduate uh, work at Princeton under Bernard Lewis, Middle East expert, fluent Arabic. His uh, nom de guerre is uh, Abu Daoud. Uh, that's that's what the sheikhs call him in the Middle East. So uh, sort of, uh, we, we both have the intelligence background. Um, he has the military background as well, but I uh, met him in the Middle East uh, doing a, a war game, an international war game, financial war game. Uh, we sort of hit it off and stayed in touch. And, and this, what we're doing in Miraglim is the continuation of what I did at the CIA, something called Project Prophecy. And I talked about Project Prophecy in Chapter 1 of my book, The Death of Money. Now, this this arose after 9-11. Uh, we were basically using capital markets data to spot terrorist activities. As you know, there was um, insider trading, terrorist uh, insider trading ahead of 9-11, the two trading days before 9-11. Average daily volume in put buying on American Airlines was 286 times average daily volume. You don't need to you don't need a PhD in finance to understand that that was a clear cut case of insider trading. So what we said at the CIA was, well, okay, if there's another spectacular terrorist attack on the way, would there be insider trading again? Could you spot it? Could you trace it to the source, get a FISA warrant, break down the door, and stop the attack? That was our project. Uh, by the way, the answer to all those questions is yes, and we spent years doing that. Uh, unfortunately, I would say for political reasons, we, with my partners, we built a working prototype. For political reasons, the CIA chose not to go forward with that, not because the technology didn't work, but because they had they didn't want to be uh, give the appearance of uh, you know looking into people's 401ks, which was not what we were doing. We were using all open source data. Anyway, long story short, um, I never quite let go of that because I could see the technology work. So what I did is I took it private started a company with Kevin, he's the perfect partner for this, and we're now working with uh, IBM uh, Laboratories, uh, their top cognitive scientists, their Watson uh, machine, uh, to basically to automate this. So, so that's what we're doing. But as it applies to predictive analytics to capital markets, we realize it's not just a counterterrorism tool, that this could be broadened to basically any indicators. So we're doing two things. Number one, just straight up predictive analytics. You know, where's the arrow going to be in three, six months? Where's gold going to be in you know three months or six months, et cetera? Uh, what's our forecast for the Fed? But but I want to be clear, we're not using any of the forecasting tools that Wall Street uses. What I said is, uh, hey, I don't want to compete against Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, or even Renaissance Technologies. I don't want to do what they're doing because they have these multi-billion-dollar budgets. Uh, but a lot of what they're doing are regressions and correlations and assuming normal distributions, a lot of really, in my view, flawed science, or if it's good statistics, it only captures you know certain things, not others. We're bringing new things to the table, um, correlation, um, you know, sorry, not, not correlation, complexity theory, 
behavioral economics, Bayesian statistics, history, and other elements to, to come up with this machine. So that's what we're doing there. Now, getting back to your point, one of our uh, dashboards is um, basically a countdown clock. We call it, our brand name for it is Omega. As you know, Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, so Omega is the end. Uh, and we're looking at um, uh, basically the, 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 the possibility of a complete collapse of the financial system. When I say that, people go, oh, you know, doom and gloom, end of the world, you know, and, and I'm not. I mean, I, life will go on. The system will collapse and life will go on. It's not the end of the world. It's just the end of the world as we know it. There'll be, you know, new new ways of living and uh, new aspects of society coming out of that. But um, this can be seen very clearly. What people don't realize, we came within hours or days of a complete collapse of financial markets twice in the last 20 years. Uh, September 28th, 1998, just minutes before the, the bailout of long-term capital management. I was there, I did that bailout. If we, we did the deal and brought it in for soft landing, but if we had not done that deal, if that had fallen apart, and it might have, every exchange in the world would have closed sequentially beginning, beginning on September 29th. Same thing, uh, late September, uh, 10 years later, 2008, um, you know, um, we had seen the sequence, um, the, the banks were bailed out by the sovereign wealth funds at the end of 97, Bear Stearns failed in March, sorry, end of 2007, Bear Stearns failed in March 98, Fannie, uh, sorry, 2008, uh, Fannie and Freddie failed in uh, June 2008, Lehman failed in September 2008, we were days away from the failure of Morgan Stanley, and then beyond that it would have been Goldman Sachs City and the same thing happening again. Fed intervened, truncated the process, but uh, so it was a strike one, strike two. I'm looking for strike three, uh, and the pressures are building up now. So you know, is this, uh, the the one thing I would say, Michael, is that in the past you were able to look for bubbles in specific places. You know, subprime, or uh, you know, in 1989 we had a bubble in junk bonds. 2008 we had a bubble in subprime, etc. Someone coined the phrase. Now, it might have been David Stockman. I'm not sure, but someone coined the phrase, the everything bubble. Uh, and I think that's about where we are now. Real estate, stocks, bonds, you name it, everything's in a bubble. Feels good while you're in it, but it's all it'll, it'll pretty much head for a crash. And you can see that statistically. So in your book, The Road to Ruin, you think that the coming crisis is going to be worse than what we had in 2008. In you know, 2008, we had pretty much a localized uh, housing bubble in the United States, and the banks were insolvent, and those that sold insurance, like AIG, uh, led to that insolvency in the financial system. But today they're saying that everything is okay. But we have a sovereign international, sovereign debt bubble, the likes of which we have never seen before. So for instance, what is a Japanese 10-year yen uh, bond uh, yielding 0% based in a yen, a currency which is pretty much uh, insolvent? And uh, you have inflation targets around the world at 2%. A debt to GDP ratio in the nation of Japan on the national basis is 250%. In Germany, the German boom, 10 year, 10 year boom, 0.5%, even below that today. Uh, an inflation target, again, of 2%, and a, a very indebted nation. In fact, around the world, Global debt has increased $70 trillion since the start of the 2008 financial crisis. So how is it that having an insolvent banking system is somehow better than having, or I'm sorry, worse, than having the entire globe having a sovereign bond crisis, which has diffused itself across the entire globe, making not only bonds, sovereign bonds in a bubble, but corporate debt, stock markets, and global real estate. All of this is one big gigantic bubble that is going to burst. And I'm, I'm hearing now talk about central banks unwinding this massive bid in bonds. Can they really do that with impunity? And that's why I believe, I, I have to laugh every day I see in the fascist financial media that things are fine, the global economy has been healed, and yet I look at a Japanese JGB 10 years out yielding zero. Is that normal? And how is that going to end well? You, you, give me your thoughts. Sure. Well, first of all, none of this is normal. That's, I think you make a good point, Michael. We have to start there. By the way, about uh, two weeks ago, Janet Yellen gave a speech. Actually, I think she might have been testifying before Congress, but be that as it may, public forum. And she, she right. said, 
uh, we will never have another financial crisis in our lifetimes. As soon as I heard that, I said, here it comes. We're going to have a financial crisis. I can think of no, you know, I'm always looking for indicators and what we, in intelligence work, what we call indications and warnings. Is, is Mary Glenn did Mary Glenn pick that oh, up? Oh, yeah, we, we, we absolutely picked that up. But uh, the point is I, I can think of no uh, better leading indicator of a financial crisis than the chairman of the Federal Reserve saying we're not going to have one. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not being glib when I say that. I mean, the Fed really doesn't get it. Your question was, can they normalize the balance sheet, normalize interest rates without causing the recession they're trying to prevent or worse or uh, causing a financial crisis? And the answer is no. They, but the problem is they think they can. Their models tell them they can. Their models tell them it's all good. They're using the Phillips curve, which has no validity, no predictive value whatsoever. Um, to me, the Phillips curve is like a unicorn. You can describe it and draw it and picture it, but it doesn't actually exist in the natural world. Um, so, so all of their models are flawed. That means they're going to go right over the cliff and not even realize it. But it doesn't mean they're not going to try. Uh, and going back to your point about the next financial crisis being uh, the larger than any before, in fact, so large, it'll be beyond the capacity of central banks to cure. And I, I do talk about that in, uh, in my book, The Road to Ruin. Um, that's why I spent so much time looking at 98 and 2008. So in 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In 2018 or 19 or you know sooner than later, keeping up this 10-year ten, tempo, who's going to bail out the central banks? And that was that was your question. In other words, each crisis gets bigger than the one before. Each bailout gets bigger than the one before. And if you use complexity theory, which I do, one of the things you learn is that the worst thing that can happen in a system, the the biggest collapse, the biggest meltdown the biggest earthquake, however you want to describe it, the worst hurricane, et cetera, is an exponential function of scale. And what that means is if you double the system or triple the system, you don't double or triple the risk. You increase it by a factor of 10 or, or 100. You, you, know, you don't even know how much you're increasing it. So, you know, it's it's nonlinear. It's a, it's a super, um, it's a super linear uh, uh, exponent. So, so the point, or super linear function, so the point being, Going back to also what you said with the $70 trillion of debt, uh, so we grossly increased the scale of the system. And not just that. That's one indicator. The size of the derivatives markets, the concentration of assets in the five largest banks, the size of the five largest banks. These are all markers of increased density functions, increased scale, uh, increased leverage, et cetera, which means the risk is way higher than it was in 2008. And that was one that the central banks could barely contain. They did contain it, but but only just barely. So where's the bailout going to come from? It can only come from one place. There's only one clean balance sheet left in the world, which is the IMF. Uh, the, the, by the way, the Federal Reserve, have a look at their balance sheet. They're leveraged 113 to 1 last time I looked. They look like a, with a, with a maturity mismatch, they look like a really bad hedge fund. But uh, the, they're not going to be able to pull this off again. By the way, what the Fed's trying to do a lot of people are confused. They say, well, gee, the Fed's tightening. If you look at 12 business cycles since the end of World War II, um, every time the Fed tightens, it's because the economy is getting stronger, which is true. And people say, well, the Fed's tightening, so the economy is getting stronger. Today, that's not true. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. Why are they tightening into weakness? The answer is that they're not following the business cycle the way they usually do. They're trying to make up for the fact that they should have tightened in 2010. They didn't because Bernanke was doing all this crazy, these crazy experiments with QE2 and QE3. Now they're trying to make up for a lost time. They are desperate to get rates up to 3 3.5% before the next recession and to get the balance sheet down to $2 trillion before the next recession. So that they can either go to QE4 or cut rates 300 basis points to get out of the recession. The problem is, can you normalize interest rates and normalize the balance sheet to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? The answer is no. Right, right, right exactly. You know, I have to laugh because I always hear the, the same mantra on the financial media is that, well, the Fed is going to go very slowly. And they're not going to send the economy into a recession. They know what they're doing. Well, did the Fed really go slowly in 2000? Was it their intent in the year 2000 to raise rates from four and a half to six and a quarter percent on the Fed funds rate and not cripple the economy? Well, they, they didn't think they were going to hurt the stock market, but the Nasdaq went down 85 percent. And 
in 2006, when they, they inverted the yield curve in 2006, and Bernanke said he was going to go in baby steps, a quarter point, a quarter point, a quarter point. And I'm sure from when Fed funds went from uh, one uh, was uh, was two percent, was one percent to to uh, five and a quarter percent in little baby steps. Well, they said they weren't going to hurt the housing market, but they ended up bringing down the whole financial system. But like you said, now we have a banking system that was insolvent, but now we have central banks that are insolvent, and we have sovereign governments that are insolvent. So the only entity left, I believe, is the IMF. I agree with you. And we're going to do something, and, and QE4 is going to look totally different, in my opinion. QE4 isn't going to be uh, a bailout of the banking system because they're going to need to hit their inflation target by doing a, a circumvention of the banking system. And I believe we're going to go head into something called helicopter money, which is a direct – it's illegal now, but I think they're going to change the rules because we know all rules are malleable and ductile when it comes to governments and disasters. So they're going to do an end run around the banking system and directly buy treasuries from the government. Can you talk about that? Well, they, they may do that, uh, but but QE4. I mean, you're right, Mike. I think that's in the cards, and they ha they have to they have to have inflation to make the debt melt away. Right now, the debt is completely unpayable. Uh, the only way out of it is to get uh, through financial repression, which is basically get the rate of inflation above the the rate on the ten year note. So if you have you know, it doesn't matter actually what the levels are. What matters is the spread. So if you can get the two, the ten-year notes to say three percent, but get inflation of four percent or four and a half percent, that delta, that one and a half percent of inflation, that melts the debt away. Now that's the plan, but I I doubt they'll be able to pull it off. I think we'll we'll, we'll fly straight into a panic. Um, by the way, but the ultimate QE is the SDR, the special drawing right. The, you know, the Fed has a printing press, they can print dollars. The ECB has a printing press, they can print euros. But not that many people know the IMF has, has, IMF has a printing press also, and they can print these special drawing rights by the trillions. Uh, by the way, one SDR equals about a dollar forty. It's, it's a floating rate, actually, there's a formula for calculating it. Uh, but they could print, you know, five trillion SDRs, which would be about, you know, six and a half, seven trillion dollars and hand that out to the members, and then they can do all these currency swaps and start spending it or running budget deficits. That money literally comes, uh, you know, uh, one one of the inventors of the SDR referred to it as manna from heaven, uh, but that's uh, but that that's how it works. So, yeah, that liquidity is going to have to come from somewhere. By the way, um, uh, not that long ago, I spoke with one of the members of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, um, you know, without mentioning names. Uh, she told me that, uh, it doesn't matter if central banks are insolvent. Uh, by the way, from time to time, not not all the time, but from time to time over the last seven or eight years, the Federal Reserve has been insolvent on a mark-to-market -market basis. Now, of course, the Fed doesn't mark-to-market, so it, it looks like they have capital. But if you mark their 10-year note positions to market, their capital would evaporate in a heartbeat, and they would be insolvent. But one of the members of the Board of Governors said it doesn't matter. Uh, so we're we're in uh, we're in uh, uncharted territory, um, but but what I know is that it is a complex dynamic system. Complex dynamic systems are prone to collapse. The worst collapse is a function of scale, exponential function of scale. And we've scaled this thing up uh, outside of the bounds of history, which means when the collapse comes, it'll be like nothing we've seen before. That that part's easy to analyze. What's hard, of course, is the timing. But in some ways, you know, the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. So I, I have people who say, hey, Jim, you know, I listen to you. I understand what you're saying. Call me up at 3 o'clock the day before, and I'll, and I'll sell my stocks and buy some gold. And I have, I have two-part answer to that. Number one, I'm not going to know the day before. I can see it coming, but I won't necessarily know the day before. Um, and number two, by then it will be too late. Because when you want your gold in those circumstances, you're not going to be able to get it. Uh, so what are you waiting for? Get you have some preparation right now. Yeah. Okay. So what would the dollars roll if we have the SDR take uh, sort of supplant uh, the dollars rolls, the reserve currency? Where do you see the U.S. dollar headed? Because it's in my mind, it's hard to see the dollar lose a tremendous amount of value against the yen or the euro or the British pound. But what about the dollars about the roll? As the world's reserve currency. Well, first of all, I agree. I agree with that. We're we're not going to have a world where somehow the dollar collapses or goes away, and all these other currencies are just fine. That that's not going to happen. You're right. The yen, the dollar, the euro, the yuan, uh, you know, other major currencies. The, w people will lose confidence in all of them at the same time. So, what's your numeraire? 
is what's your anchor? How do you how do you measure that loss of con if the if if the cross rates are not that much changed, how do you know that people are losing confidence? Well, the answer is there are other forms of money, and what are they? Well, gold, but also Bitcoin, um, you know, and other cryptocurrencies. Now, I I'm not a big fan of the cryptocurrencies. I understand that when I say I'm not a fan, I immediately get accused on social media of being you know Neanderthal, technophobe, and, all, and I'm not. I've read all the technical papers. I work with the government on on cryptocurrencies. I actually know a lot about it. Uh, but uh, I just don't. I don't own them myself. I don't recommend them to um, to clients. But but be that as it may, I would say they are a form of money. And so when you when you buy Bitcoin, for example, you're not investing. That's not an investment. It's a currency exchange. You're you're getting rid of dollars and you're taking on Bitcoin. And I buy gold. Gold is a form of money. I don't consider gold an investment. It's a form of money. So if I if I take dollars and buy gold, which I do. I'm just trading one form of money for another form of money. Same thing with Bitcoin. So these are all liquidity preferences. When I change one form of money for another, I'm expressing a liquidity preference for whatever kind of money I'm getting, or a confidence preference, trust preference, if you want to put it that way. So we'll know that all these currencies are collapsing, not by the cross rates, you're right about that, but by gold, Bitcoin, and other forms of money. That, that's how we'll know. Well, I, I get beat up, and I'm sure I'm going to get beat up after this comment, but the Bitcoin can never be money because there's an unlimited supply of cryptocurrencies. There is not an unlimited supply of base metals or, met, or sorry, precious metals in the Earth's crust that are virtually indestructible. So if, if God was creating new forms of precious metals on a daily basis that would never corrode and very, very rare, then I would say gold would be losing its value because it would have a lot of competition. Well, if there's Ethereum and, and Bitcoin and an unlimited number of other digital currencies, then how could Bitcoin be really money? It can't be because it's not rare. And it's also not indestructible either. So that, that's my comment on Bitcoin. So I want to talk a little bit more about the delusion of central banks. Let's just talk about the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve is still threatening. We had a pretty good uh, July non farm payroll report this, uh, well, I'll just say July because this was Friday, uh, put out in early August here, this, according to this interview. But the Fed is saying that they can do reverse QE now, what I call quantitative tightening or reverse QE. They're hell bent on doing that later this fall. Uh, and also the ECB is threatening to taper its assets purchase program from 60 billion per month down to zero. I think they're gonna do that probably throughout 2018. But here's the question, here's what I don't understand. So let's just look at the deficits without central bank. So you have a 10-year note that's at 2.3% or thereabouts, and you have nominal GDP running north of 4%. So that's nominal GDP and the 10-year treasury should, should, should be about the same. The correlation is very strong. So we have a long way to go to rise, but let's talk about deficits. If the Fed embarks on this reverse QE program, at its peak, they'll be selling 600 billion dollars worth of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities per annum. You'll have a baseline deficit of about a trillion dollars. If we do head into a recession, like I believe we're almost there now, we have a 1% one hand, one handle on GDP throughout the developed world, that'll add another one trillion dollars to the deficit. Then you add, uh, say, $200 billion a year for Trump's tax cut schemes. And for every 1% rise in the interest expense on the debt, you had another $200 billion. So who is going to – I could come up with a very cogent argument that annual deficits will be close to $3 trillion, $3 trillion per annum. Without a central bank buying that debt, where would interest rates go? And how is the economy going to survive? I think – I don't know if they, these central bankers are really – they should, they should uh, throw out the Phillips curve. They're looking for inflation in all the wrong places. First of all, it's ridiculous to think that an economy cannot function if inflation isn't 2%. In other words, if we had robust GDP and a low unemployment rate and inflation at 0%, then we have a problem? No, it's not a problem. They're looking for inflation in all the wrong places, but they should be – instead of worrying worry about the Phillips curve, they should worry about the, the fact that – Interest rates are going to absolutely skyrocket along with their deficits. 
Well, uh, I, I call the Phillips curve, uh, you know, the walking dead. I thought the Phillips curve was dead and buried in the early 1980s. Remember, we had inflation of 13 percent and unemployment of 10 percent. So where's you know, where's that inverse correlation? So I, I thought the, the Phillips curve was discredited decades ago, but it's back. It's a zombie and it won't go away. But the reason, by the way, is Janet Yellen, you know, she's not uh, she's really not a capital markets maven. She doesn't really know very much about what we're talking about. She's a, she's a labor economist and she's a frequentist statistician. So she's, you know, she's a statistics geek using, I would say, a very flawed statistics methodology. I prefer uh, Bayesian statistics versus frequentist statistics. So two different branches of applied uh, statistical science, number one. And she just married, she's married to the Phillips curve. So she, she personally revived it, you know, took it, dug up the grave and, you know, put it on a chair like Weekend at Bernie's. But uh, but the, that's the problem. Uh, they think they understand what, what they're doing. The Fed has never, uh, to my knowledge, never really understood the economy. Um, by the way, Michael, earlier you were talking about some of these uh, bond market massacres and stock market massacres from uh, too, you know, too fast a tempo of, of rate hikes. The one you didn't mention was a real uh, you know, slaughter. It was 1994. Uh, that was one. That was when maybe uh, uh, and I was I was around for that one. Uh, you know, that's when Orange County went bankrupt. Uh, and uh, you know, a bunch of hedge funds went out of business. Some small dealers went out of business because people were not prepared for those uh, those rate hikes. It was a meltdown in the mortgage market. And the other one was 1987. Now we all remember October 19, 1987. The stock market fell over 20 percent in one day, not a week or a month, but one day. Today that would be the equivalent about of about 4,000 Dow points or 400 S&P points in one day. But that was preceded in March 87. There was another bond market route. So th these, see, I always, one of my metaphors, but it's more than a metaphor because the science is the same. The Fed thinks they're playing with a the thermostat. You know, they can, you know, the economy's too cool. They can dial it up. The economy's too hot. They can dial it down. It's linear and reversible. They actually have their hands on the controls of a nuclear reactor. There's nothing linear or reversible about a nuclear reactor. If you melt it down, there's no such thing as a melt up. You basically, it's, you know, it's uh, Chernobyl. And so when you're playing with a the thermostat, but you're actually playing with a nuclear reactor, I mean, the risk is enormous. The Fed absolutely does not get this. So, um, but, but to come back to your original question, how can they tighten? How can they normalize the balance sheet? How can they take uh, a $600 billion a year of bids out of the bond market and not have the kinds of impact you're, you're talking about? The answer is they can't. They think they can. They're going to try, but they're probably going to cause a recession. We're close to one right now, and they're going to have to back off. Part of my bull case for gold right now is the fact, I mean, gold's, gold's done pretty well with a lot of headwinds. You know, hikes in uh, December 2016, March 2017, June 2017, announcements coming about balance sheet normalizations, et cetera. Uh, these are all headwinds for gold, and yet gold's hanging in there. The Fed's going to have to flip for the ninth time since May 2013. They're going to have to flip to easing. They won't cut rates all at once. They'll do it through forward guidance. They'll say, you know, I, I expect by the fall, they'll say, hey, just kidding about those rate hikes, you know. We'll get back to you, uh, you know, extend a period or uh, we'll be patient. You know, one of those buzzwords. Uh, by the way, I talked to the guy who used to write those things for Bernanke and Yellen. He told me, he said it's the most ridiculous process you've ever seen. He once had uh, two versions and he took them in and put them on Bernanke's desk. And Bernanke looked up at him and read them both and looked up at him and said, which one's the bad one? In other words, Bernanke didn't even know. They were just making up words. And the way they do it, they... They leak it to uh, guys like Hills and Rath, you know, who's at the Wall Street Journal at the time. And uh, they, then they tell the market what they're supposed to believe, and it's all good. So the, the whole thing's ridiculous. Uh, but look, the, the laws of, of physics, the laws of complexity, um, mathematical laws, the kinds of things you mentioned have not been repealed. Uh, they can be glossed over for a period of time. But uh, the, the whole thing's unstable. At least in the short run, the Fed's going to have to back off and go to ease. Beyond that, it's just more the same until the system collapses. You know, in 1987, we had something called portfolio insurance, but now we have the entire financial uh, conglomerate selling naked puts and sell volatility. Sure. Volatility wrung out the market. Do you, do you see any similarities between portfolio insurance and the massive selling of volatility? Sure. I mean, portfolio insurance is one particular trading strategy involving a particular set of instruments. But if you want to kind of broaden that analysis, what the real problem is when everyone's in the same trade. It, mm -hmm. it could be portfolio insurance, it could be indexing, it could be passive investing, it could be ETFs. 
could be shorting volatility, but it's when everybody's in the same trade and it's all good and everyone's making money, then there's a catalyst and you have a, 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 a you cross a critical threshold uh, and all of a sudden everyone's mindset changes and everybody wants to get out of the trade at once, that's when markets collapse. So uh, yeah, back then it was portfolio insurance, right now it's passive investing. Think about how indexing works. So I, I jump in, I decide I can't beat the market because that's what you know Jeremy Sigel and the egghead professors tell me. So I go into an index fund and some money comes in. So what does the manager of the index fund do? They buy the index. What happens? It goes up. What, how do I feel? Hey, it feels good. I just made some money. Throw some more money at it. Buy more, it goes up. You know, and then more money comes in. So you get into this this feedback loop, positive feedback loop, where money chasing the index makes the index go up, which brings in more money, which brings the index. And that's all good until it is until something says, you know, seller, uh, I want I want my I want my money back. Best description of a financial panic I've ever heard is everybody wants their money back. You know, people think they people say, Well, I have money in the stock market, I have money in the bond market, I have money in real estate. And I say, No, you don't. You have stocks, bonds, and real estate. That's not money. If you want money, you have to sell those things and get your money back. When everybody wants their money back, that's a panic. Now, what will this catalyst be? I get asked that all the time. And my answer is it doesn't matter. It could be 50 things. It could be um, some of which we can see coming, like a war with North Korea, a trade war with China, uh, a maxi currency devaluation by China in early 2018. Some of these things you can see a mile away. But it might be something no one's thought of. Uh, uh, you know, you rack your brain, but you know something else comes up. It doesn't matter. The point is, we're poised for the collapse. It only takes a catalyst. When it happens, it'll happen very fast. It'll catch everybody off guard. My advice to people is, you can see it coming. Get ready now. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this up soon. But I don't want to let you go without talking about President Donald Trump and his possible engagement in a currency and trade war with China. What do you think the likelihood of that occurring in the uh, near future? And that just kind of adds to, to all of the tumult that is headed for the market in the fall with the DC dysfunction and the ECB's taper and the Fed's reverse QE, all that's going to come in the fall. You talk about a catalyst. How about a preliminary strike against the missile silos in North Korea? or the launching of a currency and trade war with China? Well, I would say the chance of a currency and trade war with China is 100% because it's already here. I, I never give 100% forecast. I might be 90% plus uh, with you know very high confidence, but uh, but that, that trade war is already here. Uh, now, of course, you go back to June 2015 when Trump announced he was running for president through the election. So, you know, about a year and a half, what did he say? You know, China is the greatest currency manipulator in history. China subsidizes steel, aluminum. They steal our intellectual property. They steal our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to hammer them With so Peter hard. Navarro, the, the, the death, uh, death by China. Correct. So, yeah. But then he gets sworn in and nothing happens. Not one single thing was done from uh, uh, Inauguration Day until literally the, the last couple of days. Why was that? Well, the answer is that. Trump met with President Xi at Mar-a-Lago on April 6th and asked Xi's help on North Korea. Uh, he said, I'll lay off the currency wars and the trade wars and the rhetoric. I'll give you a break uh, if you help me with North Korea. And, and Xi said, I need a little time, you know, typical Chinese. And Trump says, I'll give you 100 days. Well, the 100 days were up July 15th. And even beginning at the end of June, and Trump and some of his tweets said, you know, China tried, but they didn't do anything. Now he's getting a lot more harsh. But the bottom line is, it's very clear China's not going to do anything about North Korea, whether they can't do it or choose not to, doesn't matter, they're not going to do it. So Trump's like, okay, you didn't hold up your end, this is the art of the deal, right? You didn't hold up your end, now the gloves are off. And and Trump has what I call the trade troika, it's Robert Lighthizer, U.S. Trade Representative, Wilbur Ross, Secretary of Commerce, and Peter Navarro, who's um, White House Counsel, uh, head of the U.S. International Trade Council. All three of them are hawks, all three of them are trade hawks. They've been sort of kept off stage. Now they're front and center. And you're going to see announcements uh, really worldwide, not just about on steel, not just about China, but worldwide on steel. Chinese aluminum subsidies, retaliation for theft of intellectual property, specific sanctions aimed at large Chinese financial institutions that are facilitating hard currency payments in and out of North Korea, um, and, uh, you know, and a host of other, uh, other sanctions of various kinds. Of course, the Congress just threw down the gauntlet with a trade war with Russia, Russia putting on financial sanctions, uh, uh, economic sanctions on Russia, having to do with oil and natural gas, which are existential to Russia. So we're in a trade war, 
and a currency war with China and Russia at the same time, and we're going to be in a shooting war with North Korea by, I would say, early to mid-2018. So the U.S. is alone. Uh, we're fighting everybody at once. Uh, and by the way, this is reminiscent of the 1920s and 30s. Remember, that started with a currency war in you know Weimar, French devaluation 1925, English devaluation 1931, U.S. devaluation 1933. It's a currency war. It turned into a trade war with Smoot Hawley and other tariffs, and then ended up as a shooting war in uh, Manchuria, Poland, and Pearl Harbor. So we seem to be going down that road again. Well, if you're looking for a catalyst, uh, <laughs> you're talking about a shooting war with North Korea, and out and out the economic sanctions against against China. Uh, if that's going to get me to in a panic, cover my naked puts by buying puts or shorting stocks. That's how you cover a naked put uh, uh, right. trade. Uh, that's, your, that's your catalyst yep. for a, a complete Armageddon in the stock market. And maybe instead of the stock market trading at 135% of the economy, uh, which is pretty much an all time high outside of a very. Welcome back to the Pentonomics program, the alternative to the silly, inane, fatuous financial media. Today's guest is Jim Rickards. Now, I can spend the entire program, which hopefully will be around 20 minutes, just going over this gentleman's resume. So I won't do that. I'll just go over the highlights. Jim Rickards is an economist, a banker, a lawyer. He's the Capital Markets Advisor for the Secretary of Defense and Intelligence Community. He's the editor of the Strategic Intelligence, a financial newsletter published by Agora, of which I am a daily reader, and I suggest my audience do the same. Uh, he's the director of the James Richards Project, an inquiry into the complex dynamics of geopolitics. And by the way, in his spare time, he's a prolific writer of books. He wrote The Cur uh, Currency Wars, the Death of Money, The New Case for Gold, and his most recent uh, publication, The Road to Room. Welcome, Jim Rickards. Michael, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Great to be with you. You created the predictive analytics company called Meridian. What does it have to, t have to say about the coming stock market chaos? I believe the stock market is in for a huge fall, probably north of 50%. I believe we're in a huge bond bubble, and I think I'm pretty much alone in this because if I watch the fatuous financial media, everybody's a huge bubble. Right. You don't feel the same way. You created this program. What does it have to say about what's coming down the pipeline? Oh, thank you, Michael. This uh, this new company, Miraglam, I started with uh, a partner, Kevin Massingill. Uh, Kevin's a fascinating guy. He's a um, he's a lieutenant colonel, uh, army ranger, um, military intelligence. Uh, but also a scholar, uh, graduate. Um, we had seen the sequence. Um, the, the banks were bailed out by the sovereign wealth funds at the end of 97. Bear Stearns failed in March, sorry, end of 2007. Bear Stearns failed in March 98. Fannie, uh, sorry, 2008. Uh, Fannie and Freddie failed in uh, June 2008. Lehman failed in September 2008. We were days away from the failure of Morgan Stanley, and then beyond that, it would have been Goldman Sachs City, and the same thing happening again. Fed intervened, truncated the process, but uh, so it was a strike one, strike two. I'm looking for strike three, uh, and the pressures are building up now. So you know, is this, uh, the the one thing I would say, Michael, is that in the past you were able to look for bubbles in specific places, you know, subprime or uh, you know, in 1989 we had a bubble in junk bonds, 2008 we had a bubble in subprime, etc. Someone coined the phrase. It might have been David Stockman. I'm not sure, but someone coined the phrase, the everything bubble. Uh, and I think that's about where we are now. Real estate, stocks, bonds, you name it, everything's in a bubble. Feels good while you're in it, but it's all it'll, it'll pretty much head for a crash. And you can see that statistically. So in your book, The Road to Ruin, you think that the coming crisis is going to be worse than what we had in 2008. You know, 2008, we had pretty much a localized uh, housing bubble in the United States, and the banks were insolvent, and those that sold insurance, like AIG, uh, led to that insolvency in the financial system. But today they're saying that everything is okay. But we have a sovereign international, sovereign debt bubble, the likes of which we have never seen before. 
So for instance, what is a Japanese 10-year yen uh, bond uh, yielding 0% based in a yen, a currency which is pretty much uh, insolvent? And uh, you have inflation targets around the world at 2%. A debt to GDP ratio in the nation of Japan on the national basis is 250%. In Germany, the German boom, 10 year, 10 year boom, 0.5%. Broaden to basically any indicators. So we're doing two things. Number one, just straight up predictive analytics. You know, where's the euro going to be in three, six months? Where's gold going to be in you know three months or six months, et cetera? Uh, what's our forecast for the Fed? But, but I want to be clear, we're not using any of the forecasting tools that Wall Street uses. What I said is, uh, hey, I don't want to compete against Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs or even Renaissance Technologies. I don't want to do what they're doing because they have these multi-billion dollar budgets. Uh, but a lot of what they're doing are regressions and correlations and assuming normal distributions. A lot of really, in my view, flawed science. Or if it's good statistics, it only captures you know certain things, not others. We're bringing new things to the table, um, correlation, um, you know, sorry, not, not correlation, complexity theory, behavioral economics, Bayesian statistics, history, and other elements to, to come up with this machine. So that's what we're doing there. Now, getting back to your point, one of our uh, dashboards is um, basically a countdown clock. We call it, our brand name for it is Omega. Uh, as you know, Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, so Omega is the end. Uh, and we're looking at... Um, uh, basically, the, the 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 possibility of a complete collapse of the financial system. When I say that, people go, "Oh, you know, doom and gloom, end of the world." You know, and and I'm not. I mean, I, life will go on. The system will collapse, and life will go on. It's not the end of the world. It's just the end of the world as we know it. There'll be you know new new ways of living and uh, new aspects of society coming out of that. But um, this can be seen very clearly. What people don't realize, we came within hours or days of a complete collapse of financial markets twice in the last 20 years. Uh, September 28, 1998, just minutes before the, the bailout of long-term capital management, I was there, I did that bailout. If we, we did the deal and brought it in for soft landing, but if we had not done that deal, if that had fallen apart, and it might have, every exchange in the world would have closed sequentially beginning, beginning on September 29th. Same thing, uh, late September, uh, 10 years later, 2008, um, you know, do it, uh, work at Princeton under Bernard Lewis, Middle East expert, fluent in Arabic. His uh, nom de guerre is uh, Abu Dawood. Uh, that's that's what the sheikhs call him in the Middle East. So, uh, sort of, uh, we, we both have the intelligence background. Um, he has the military background as well, but I uh, met him in the Middle East uh, doing a, a war game, an international war game, financial war game. Uh, we sort of hit it off and stayed in touch. And, and this, what we're doing in Miraglim is the continuation of what I did at the CIA, something called Project Prophecy. And I talked about Project Prophecy in Chapter 1 of my book, The Death of Money. Now, this this arose after 9-11. Uh, we were basically using capital markets data to spot terrorist activities. As you know, there was um, insider trading, terrorist uh, insider trading ahead of 9-11, the two trading days before 9-11. Average daily volume in put buying on American Airlines was 286 times average daily volume. You don't need to you don't need a PhD in finance to understand that, that was a clear cut case of insider trading. So what we said at the CIA is well, okay, if there's another spectacular terrorist attack on the way, would there be insider trading again? Could you spot it? Could you trace it to the source, get a FISA warrant, break down the door and stop the attack? That was our project. Uh, by the way, the answer to all those questions is yes and spent years doing that. Uh, unfortunately I would say for political reasons we, with my partners, we built a working prototype. For political reasons, the CIA chose not to go forward with that, not because the technology didn't work, but because they had they didn't want to be uh, give the appearance of uh, you know looking into people's 401ks, which was not what we were doing. We were using all open source data. Anyway, long story short, um, I never quite let go of that because I could see the technology work. So what I did is I took it private, started a company with Kevin. He's the perfect partner for this. And we're now working with uh, IBM uh, Laboratories. Uh, they're top cognitive scientists. They're Watson uh, machine uh, to basically to automate this. So, so that's what we're doing. But as it applies to predictive analytics of capital markets, we realize it's not just a counterterrorism tool that this could be below that today. Uh, an inflation target again of two percent and a, a very indebted nation 
In fact, around the world, global debt has increased $70 trillion since the start of the 2008 financial crisis. So how is it that having an insolvent banking system is somehow better than having, or I'm sorry, worse, than having the entire globe having a sovereign bond crisis, which has diffused itself across the entire globe, making not only bonds, sovereign bonds in a bubble, but corporate debt, stock markets, and global real estate. All of this is one big gigantic bubble that is going to burst. And I'm, I'm hearing now talk about central banks unwinding this massive bid in bonds. Can they really do that with impunity? And that's why I believe, I, I have to laugh every day, I see in the fascist financial media that things are fine, the global economy has been healed, and yet I look at a Japanese JGB 10 years out yielding zero. Is that normal? And how is that going to end well? You, you, give me your thoughts. Sure. Well, first of all, none of this is normal. That's, I think you make a good point, Michael. We have to start there. By the way, about uh, two weeks ago, Janet Yellen gave a speech. Actually, I think she might have been testifying before Congress, but be that as it may, public forum. And she, she right. said, uh, we will never have another financial crisis in our lifetimes. As soon as I heard that, I said, here it comes. We're going to have a financial crisis. I can think of no, you know, I'm always looking for indicators and what we, in intelligence work, what we call indications and warnings. Is, is Merrick Lynn, did Merrick Lynn pick that oh, up? Oh, yeah, we, we, we absolutely picked that up. But uh, the point is, I, I can think of no uh, better leading indicator of a financial crisis than the chairman of the Federal Reserve saying we're not going to have one. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not being glib when I say that. I mean, the Fed really doesn't get it. Your question was, can they normalize the balance sheet, normalize interest rates without causing the recession they're trying to prevent or worse or uh, causing a financial crisis?